Oh, thank you, Virginia. Um, look, thank you for asking me to be here. Um, I, I think I have to first start a little bit um, about the foundation, because I believe it's everybody's right to have good food. Uh, food is medicine, the fuel of life. It's what fires our appetite for life, no matter what age. So my foundation journey began back in 2010 when I was made Senior Australian of the Year. Now, uh, before I quite realized I was a senior, and I had to acknowledge it and right at that time, uh, I certainly don't feel it. Um, and uh, it was a turning point in my life in that I, was, I had 900 requests to speak that year as senior Australian, and don't worry, I didn't do them all, but the most important one was um, being asked to speak at a conference of 1,000 CEOs of aged care in Tasmania for their annual conference. Now, I thought I had a pile of solutions, but it wasn't the right time, and most of them hated me. <laughs> well, uh, but a thread from there led me to forming the foundation um, that took till May 2014 with one main purpose, to make the food experience for everyone as they age a positive one so they can lead uh, a meaningful uh, a meaningful life uh, uh, as they age, whether at homes or in the community. And that's really important to me because without beautiful food, there can't be the nutrition or the energy to be involved physically as well as mentally. And, um, and without pleasure, that can't happen either. Pleasure is important no matter our age. And so we need equal measures of pleasure and nutrition. Um, pleasure has such a bearing on well-being, no matter what age or what physical state. Something that everyone deserves, but none more so than the elderly or the ill who become unable to look after themselves. And everyone deserves to lead a good life to the end of their life and to ensure that the end of their life is as meaningful as it can be. So everything we do at the foundation is geared to our objectives, to advocate for good food experience for older people and thus improve their emotional and physical health and well-being, but to help older people access affordable, familiar, fresh and wholesome food in the community too. And, you know, when I, I look at it, you might think that um, the foundation purpose seems simple. Um, at least I felt it was simple until uh, my naivety was pushed aside. Um, find out the impediments and the needs and the opportunities. And by drawing on the experience and wisdom of those doing it well, because there are people doing it well, um, to help resolve the difficulties and the outcomes. Outcome really presents a rich recipe. Uh, I know that there is no point in, in um, uh, sitting on all the bad things that happen. We have to work with the good and use them as templates of, of what is possible. You might think it's um, a utopian ideal, but there is no place for institutionalised food anywhere. And I'm not just talking about aged care. <laughs> I, I'm talking about hospitals, I'm talking about organisations, schools, mental uh, facilities. This is truly such an important issue and it doesn't need to be, but it needs new thinking. It needs to be able to step back and, and, and find better ways. The better ways are there when, when there are people who understand how important it is. Um, and for that, I'm talking about champions Champions, let's take an aged care home for instance. There needs to be two champions, one the cook and the chef and the CEO um, uh, or the CFO um, because uh, uh, we, yes, it needs to be a concerted effort where absolutely everyone involved from the carers to the nursing staff to the ground staff, everyone has to be part of, of changing a culture. And that's, that's a particular thing for me in aged care homes. Um, 
And I visited many, um, particularly when I was um, pulling together a keynote speech for these 1,000 CEOs. Um, and I had good, great, and very bad experiences. But I learned from every one of them. Now, food is the center of the plate for me. And it's an obvious way to improve elders' um, everyday living, nourishing the body and soul. But many other things come around that. And I'll get back to that. See, I absolutely know that society wants to care, but are afraid of the conversations. <sighs> there is no doubt, no matter how united and capable a family is, they need palliative care. Practical as well as supportive care is, is necessary. And I have just finished, really only just finished this book by Kelly Curtin, a former TV presenter from Victoria wrote, and it's called, What Will I Wear to Your Funeral? Well, to me, it was the most heart-wrenching yet heart-expanding experience of a daughter chronicling the last of her mother's life in a way that is so rich and as I wish it could be for all. I'll come back to that later. We all know that palliative care seeks to neither shorten nor prolong life, but to improve quality of life and manage systems, uh, symptoms so people can enjoy to the full the time that they have. And we need to be looking for ways to meet the social, emotional, and spiritual needs alongside managing physical symptoms. To provide relief from pain is a given, but I would also see that helping patients to live as actively as possible is also such an important key. Even if assisted out into the garden to be regaled with a sense, as we know well, as I do working with dementia patients, that a sensory garden lessens anxiety and gives pleasure and sense, um, and, and there is evidence of a relaxation response in being in nature. And evidence, evidence that I read time and time again that our strongest memories are tied to the part of the brain responsible for smelling, the last, the last sense to go, it would seem. And of course, I come back to music that has been important to a patient's life. I've just come across two small flat microphones that go under the pillow. And, and I, I know that um, I think about what I would want. And I would want music and, and podcasts. <laughs> podcasts of all the things that I wish I had have known in life. Um, but pleasure, relaxation, and passive stories of interest that are so available to us today. Again, I get back to feeling because someone is dying doesn't mean they are not interested in living till the end, and that is our responsibility. It's so important to me that the patient should be the most important in managing their illness and planning their care with their with their family, of course. And not that conversations like this are easy, but one thing I believe is important is the need for straightforward, honest conversations from doctors with no ambiguity about disease and prognosis. But seeing the patient in terms of the best well-being possible and discussions about therapies that may help but whilst a patient is well enough to understand and discuss with family about how they want to see the time out. The ability to get their affairs in order. We need to be encouraging elders and their families to be able to carry out the wishes of the person dying. So the rituals are all of a rite of passage exactly that was wanted. So it can be a celebration of life and I, I being selfish here and put myself in the picture, thinking of what I would want. And I really encourage you to, to read this book. I have, I have heard stories of patients being nursed at home with the involvement of family and close friends, yet when things change and the need to go to a hospital, all the planning and the wishes of the patient and family get caught up in the running of the business of the hospital. How do we tackle that? Again, the fact that someone is dying is a prognosis, but it's up to us all for the living still to be done as rich as possible. 
Now, I always think in terms of food. Everything I do, I think in terms of food and the pleasure it can bring and see it as a key to one of the last things people can exercise choice around and receive enjoyment from. And for those in palliative care, there are still ways we can provide pleasure through food. And I want to tell you about the work of, of a very good friend, Peter Morgan Jones, who has written two cookbooks for people who find it difficult to chew and swallow or use cut cutlery, as he's the executive chef of Hammond Homes in Sydney. And he was actually the thread that came out of, he was the outcome of the thread that came from that conference back in 2010, when the um, uh, director of Hammond Homes, Dr. Stephen Judd, brought me up to Sydney and said, how can we change? What is, what is the catalyst for change so food can be truly important for dementia residents? And, and this man has done so much, and it was because of the work he was doing with the, the uh, background of, of um, Heston Blumenthal's uh, molecular gastronomy, what he brought to dementia food, and, and what he's done with the foundation and for, for people with dementia is extraordinary. But this, this is something uh, that he is working on now. And he's in the early stages of writing a cookbook for people receiving palliative care. And one ingenious concept likely to feature in the book, will feature in the book, is molecular air. Now, people have seen the joy of this simple concept can bring, having trialed it on a friend's 14-year-old son who's been th fed through a peg in his stomach for eight years. Moved by the boy not having experienced the food for such a long time, Peter devised a way of delivering flavor and fragrance through tiny bubbles that the boy could safely savor on his tongue. First, he created a liquid, blending fresh strawberries and ice cream, and passing it through a sieve, he then added a binding agent to help the formation of bubbles using a small, clean, battery-powered fish pump, plastic tubing, and a pipette. He frothed the liquid into a delicate foam. You spoon that off and you can actually smell the fresh strawberries and ice cream. You can put it on the tongue and they have the flavor and it pops and it just disappears into nothing like a flavored water bubble. <coughs> you don't need to swallow it. Innovation is what we need. Innovation, how can we deliver it? And Peter Morgan-Jones, he's, he's collaborating with Professor Roderick McLeod, a senior staff specialist in palliative care and co-joint professor of the University of Sydney, who's based at Hammond Care's Greenwich Hospital. And he is also working with an occupational therapist, dietitian, and speech pathologist. This is really important stuff. There are also issues like appetite loss, metallic tastes with, with the dying, with the elderly. The, that appetite loss and metallic taste sometimes caused by chemotherapy can impact on the people's enjoyment of food at the end of their life. But while they may not be able to eat a meal in the same way as they used to, we have to find ways, and, and we are working on that, to provide the joy of food to those to gain pleasure of it, uh, from it again. And um, I know the book will be launched in Palliative Care Week in 2018. It takes a while for books to be done, sadly. But these, these are people's last moments, and they should be able to eat what they want to eat. It's about, it's about some sense of control. We need to think of food and dining as a holistic experience and the entire community that's involved with making this food experience a pleasurable one. Families, carers, nurses, management staff, chefs and cooks, everyone has a part to play in, uh, with someone in care, but especially palliative care has a meaningful experience right to the end, but it's much more than food. It's the meaningful connections that can be made every day with a resident or someone in palliative care. Uh, 
Food and nutrition is a huge part which goes hand in hand with mental stimulation and keeping the body and mind active. And, and when we work in um, uh, our work with a foundation with aged care, that's a truly important, um, truly important part. And it goes back to the issue of helping anything physical that is possible that someone is still able to do. Um, music, I've touched on, it's almost as important as food in my life. And um, do, um, with the foundation, what we do, one of the very practical things we do is several times a year, we, we do um, master classes where we draw together 30 cooks and chefs from all over Australia and we bring them in for two and a half days. We've just done one two weeks ago in the Barossa. And, and what we do um, in that time is, is give them ideas, we give them inspiration, we, we listen to their problems, we help to find solutions. We then, have, um, we then have a masterclass for the CEOs on the third day, and we, as we did with 40 CEOs from aged care um, uh, just 10 days ago. And we advocate on the cooks and chefs' behalf, and, 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 but what we do um, what we do is make them understand the cooks and chefs who are considered the lowliest of the low in many places um, and within the food industry are considered the lowest of the low and it should, it's the very reverse of what should be because these are the people that can make such a difference in the lives of every single person they look after. So what we do is give them respect and kudos and, and, and ideas and connection with each other and we also and we don't just talk about food, we talk about community, we talk about gardens, um, uh, we talk about music. And um, uh, our very first one, we showed this amazing documentary the last night of 30 cooks and chefs. Um, and, and we showed them this document, a Canadian documentary called Alive Inside. Now, I do believe it was the original work of um, Dr. Al Oliver Sacks, who wrote Musicophilia, and has many case studies of the difference that music makes to people's life um, at the end of their life, right through their life. But this, this was the most amazing documentary in terms of catch capturing the hearts of everyone in that room because it showed, it showed an example of headphones being put on the head of, of this, this Negro gentleman who had been monosy hardly monosyllabic for 10 years and then surrounded by his family, the music of, of this gentleman's youth was put onto the headsets and he came alive. And that wasn't just one, that was the most powerful example within the documentary, but time and time again, memories, memories that are so important to the individual. And this, this had such resonance that one of the cooks and chefs that went back to their aged care home in Victoria raised the money um, through making a cookbook of all of the family's favorite comfort food and bought headphones for every resident in, um, in the home. Uh, music is so, so important. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, and as I said before, I know music and family, the importance of that to the end of my life, bringing joy and happiness to, um, to the last moments. I know when you're wanting to change a culture, as I am wanting to do with the foundation, and to make beautiful food part of every elder's life, examples or stories of what's possible and what makes a difference is how I work. It's, it's, the, best, it's the best trigger for change. It's about cultural change, a whole commitment um, of so many people who can come together to enhance the life of all, not just elders till the end of their life, everybody. 
We give workshops, as I said, to encourage those ideas and inspirations. It's about knowledge and skill and the respect and importance. And that is what changes the lives. And it's something that is that needed in the specialized training of palliative carers who, who make such a difference to the lives of not only the patients, but the families around them. I know um, giving skills and ideas to people who already have the empathy to help enrich the lives of a patient uh, until their last moments show what a rewarding career it can be. And I, I can't help um, thinking how much we have to learn from a discussion I've had with a friend of mine um, who was, um, who was a, a volunteer at Bear Cottage, one of Australia's three children's hospices you would know in Australia. And my friend uh, Annabelle said, and this really resonated with me, they always said you can't add years to the children's lives but can add life to their years and how food is so important to them. And I'm sure, I, I know so little about palliative care except for my own experiences and the little I've read and I see at the end of life of some of those in aged care and it's not always good um, in aged care homes. Um, but the importance of food resonates no matter where I look. And, and, um, and the lovely things, the lovely stories, because that's, the lovely stories give you something to hold on to. She told me of the chef there making the favorite food to be part of creating shared memories for the family, but making it with the children, having the children involved in any way they can, talked of balloons coated with chocolate, Ooh, so the, the texture, the feel, the stickiness, even if they're not able to use their muscles really well. But it all comes down to the ability to have fun is within us all, and humour has such, such an important part. Um, uh, it's such an important part of our lives. I never want to stop being passionate about what I eat, and I want to make sure every older Australian has the same opportunity. Pleasure and nutrition side by side, as I said before, where every bite counts, gives the maximum possibility of well-being. Beautiful food can do so much, but it can't do it alone. Human contact, human contact and kindness and doing and belonging. And I, I just, I just can't help thinking that we have much to learn. And I, I want, to, I want to just finish before questions, in case there are questions. Um, I didn't read the beginning, you know, the little snippets about thoughts from someone who had read the book before, and I didn't read the back page till I finished the book. But there were two things here when I went back to, to, in, to look at every single page, things that really resonated with me. And this were, these were comments from people. It is deeply moving, but not trite. This is this, is this book, what, what will I wear to your funeral? It's not trite and answers questions I didn't even realize I had about dying. I cried, laughed, and it made me assess my own relationships. And reading this book really made me the other that really resonated, this is a love story. I feared that my own experience of loss would make that reading about the intimacy of dying too painful, but it is done in a way that I found comforting. So the book, What Will I Wear to Your Funeral, poses questions like, how do I look after your orchid? Kelly wanted to ask her mother so many questions while she still could. When you don't go a day without speaking to someone, how do you say goodbye forever? It didn't bear thinking about. So when Pamela Curtin is diagnosed with cancer, her family plead with her to try everything that might give them more time. She reluctantly agrees, but on one condition, life goes on because it has to and does with a weekly family dinner with wine and loud sibling banter, with grace, guts and cups of tea, the matriarch prepares herself and those she loves for the inevitable. Their conversations are honest, funny, 
and at times confronting, where a shade of lipstick might be the only bright side. This has had a profound effect on me, um, and uh, I just, I just know that there is a lot to be learned. There's a lot to be less feared about conversations we need to have with our families to make sure that life is lived to the very last with as many pleasures as is possible to give. And beautiful food is always going to be part of that. So thank you.